Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Another Friday evening Bible study slash sermon. Um, grateful to be here tonight. It's been an incredible week, as you can see. I am in a different location, and I have been busy, busy, busy. Um, I would ask you to bear with me. If I stumble over my words tonight, it's because I'm very tired. Um, and I just ask you to bear with me. and Please keep me in prayers. I want to thank you for your prayers. Hey, J-Lo, I want to thank you for your prayers, guys, because um, I'm working 90 hours a week right now, 16 to 17 hour days. Physically, uh, a lot of the work's very physical, and then the ministerial work is very heavily taxing as well, mentally and spiritually. And um, many times I'm fatigued. And let me tell you, uh, we're going to talk about prayer tonight. We're going to continue about prayer and effective prayer, but I want to thank you for your prayers because I reached out like two days ago saying, hey, I need prayers for strength and endurance. And let me tell you, they were answered because I was physically fatigued, exhausted. Um, and I asked for those prayers and the spirit came upon me. And when I should have been exhausted and laying down, I wasn't. Um, hey, blessed Sabbath, Brother Leo. Glad to have you here, brother. Um, I should have been exhausted. Leo does uh, construction and flooring. I'm doing ministry and I'm also doing construction right now for the ministry. And so physically exhausted, like 17 hour days. And because of the prayers that people are giving, um, I really felt strengthened. So we're doing a series on prayer. And why would we want to look at prayer? Well, so far we looked at what prayer is, where it came from, the privileges and benefits of prayer. And we looked at the conditions that make it the most effective. Now, so far we looked at praying fervently, praying with a spirit of unceasing thanksgiving, um, watchfulness in prayer. We looked at how obedience affects our prayers being answered. We looked at forgiving others and how that affects our prayers being answered. We looked at faith and how that is critical in our prayers. And we looked at perseverance in our prayers. Now, there's a lot of massive reasons why we should pray and why we should learn to pray effectively. Like uh, Brother Leo, I think, does flooring and does construction. Hey, Kim and hey, Tina. Happy Sabbath. Imagine he wants to be good at his job. He's going to learn how to do it, to do it well. And many Christians never really study prayer and study how to get good at prayer. Now, let me stop here and say this. I don't want you to be intimidated. If you don't know how to pray, just pray. God is your father. Just talk to him. But as you advance as a Christian, learn how your prayers can be more effective. And there are massive reasons why we should look into this privilege of prayer and why we should look into effective prayer. Uh, you've seen the church signs before. It says seven days without prayer makes one week. Oh, it's the truth. But brothers and sisters, I would like to tell you, hey, sister, is it Danella? If I say it wrong, just tell me on the messages. I'll read them. I don't know if I'm saying it right. But prayer, I have found, and you can say amen or no, prayer turns your what ifs into what is. Now, we have lots of what ifs in our life. We say, what if the world was a better place? What if my children would accept Christ? What if I could help homeless people? And through prayer, those what ifs turn into what is. And I have found, thank you, sister. I'm glad I got it right. I have found that when prayer is a habit, miracles are a lifestyle. Let me say that again. When prayer is a habit, miracles are a lifestyle. A sea couldn't stop Moses. A wall couldn't stop Joshua. A giant couldn't stop David. And death couldn't stop Jesus. And one thing they all had in common was prayer. They had strong prayer lives and they fervently prayed. Now, prayer makes us unstoppable. Hey, sister, it's Kimberly. I think I got it. So why wouldn't we want to learn to pray effectively? Before we move into the conditions... Uh, we're going to look at two conditions tonight to turbocharge your prayers, to make them stronger, critical conditions for them to be answered. But why wouldn't we want to learn to pray effectively? Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. I tell you what, let's have our own word of prayer and then we'll open up the word. Our gracious Heavenly Father, please be with us, Lord. I'm so grateful you remind me to pray. Please bless your word and send the spirit of truth as we enter into your Sabbath hours. Lord, I'm grateful for the week I've had. Let your spirit teach. Let your spirit teach me and teach us. Father, we need you so desperately. I pray for this in the name of Jesus, saying, Thy will be done. Amen. Ecclesiastes 10.10 says, If the axe be blunt, and he, he do not sharpen the edge, then he must put forth more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. 
Consider that, brothers and sisters. If you use a dole axe to chop a tree down, it might take you all day. But if you spend some time sharpening it, you'll chop that tree right down. Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I'll spend the four, first four hours sharpening the axe. Well, why wouldn't we want to take that into our prayer life? Now, God hears all our prayers, but wouldn't we want to be more effective as Christians? Maybe we're bludgeoning a tree, so to speak, with a, a blunt object, when if we would learn to hone our prayers, they'd be answered far quicker. What are prayers? What is the privilege? Prayer is a great equalizer. We said this each time that we've talked about it. It's available to everyone. The poor man's prayer and the rich man's prayer both reach the throne of heaven just the same. It's, it's a way that you can rise up and talk to God and commune with him. And no part of the ministration in the Old Testament of the priesthood, at no part did they get closer to God than when they were at the altar of incense, which represents prayer. Prayer brings us closer to God. So let me ask, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Do you want to see change in your life? Are you tired of unfairness and the pain of your experience in your daily life? Well, maybe you should stop venting and start praying. Because you don't need sympathy, you need strength. You don't need validation from others, you need victory from God. You can tell other people about your problems, and you're going to get sympathy, you're going to get uh, validation, but you're not going to get victory, and you're not going to get strength. That comes from God, and it's through prayer that we get it. Hey, Brother Daniel, prayer is a way to attain to both peace and clarity, which we saw that before with Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I'm going to quote that one so I can pull out one more point about that. Hey, Sister Lynn, good to see you here. Saw you in person the other day. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, in supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Now, it says, don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing is old English. It means don't worry. Don't worry about anything, but pray to God and he will help you. He will direct you. And it says that the peace of God that passes all understanding will be given to you. Let me pull out one more point of this verse before we move on. We get angry in our lives. We have problems. Sometimes we can't see clearly. You cannot see your reflection in boiling water. You can't see your reflection in boiling water, but you can see it in a calm, serene lake, in the waters of a calm lake. If we're angry, we're not going to think straight, and we're not going to see things clearly to be able to reflect on them and make the right decisions. But if you take time to pray and seek counsel at the mouth of the Lord, well, the peace of God that passes all understanding will come upon you, and you will see the situation clearly. The Lord will direct you. When we're overwhelmed, Prayer is a way that God will let us think straight. The peace that passes understanding will come upon us. We're not going to see clearly in those boiling waters. So prayer is not just a way to know God. It's a way to know ourselves. And this time of communion with God is a privilege. No man ever prayed fervently without learning something. Uh, you can't see clearly. In the heat of the battle, you want to say something. You want to get angry. You want to do those things. But what you need to do is pull aside. Now, Brother Daniel, let me let me say this. He said, I need to hear this today. Amen. That's awesome that you're here. I, I think that probably you get some time out in the tree stand in the woods, and I bet that that is getting away from people because I know you work like an insane amount of hours, and probably being out by yourself gives you time to see the reflection clearly. But we're in this churned up, troubled waters like a boiling pot, and we can't see what's going on clearly. But prayer, prayer allows us to have a better understanding, a better grasp of everything. It requires more of the heart than of the tongue. And our prayers need to mean something to us if they're going to mean anything to God. Nobody, uh, if, if you rise up from prayer, a better man or a woman, then your prayer has already been answered. And, and Knowing this, knowing how powerful prayer is, how critical it is for our well-being and for those around us, led us to continue looking at effective prayer tonight. We're not going to be long tonight. It's going to be a short one. Um, but prayer changes things, and I want to pull out a point about that. Just because uh, your destination might not change overnight, that doesn't mean that your direction won't. 
Many people say, well, I'm praying and I'm not where I want to be yet. But if you turn, you're changing your direction, which is just as important as getting to your destination. So many people think that things aren't happening quick enough, but we have to be patient and persevering as we saw that last week in prayer. And many people, uh, they're so impatient. This world is so confused. People used to pray before they eat. Now they take pictures of their food and put it on Facebook. And we wonder why the world is so full of troubles. It's because of the way we approach life. We're not taking that time aside to think clearly and to pray. Whether it be family problems, problems with your wife, problems with your husband, problems with your job. Take it to the Lord. As Philippians says, worry about nothing. And everything, bring it to the Lord and he will fix it. And prayer isn't just about asking for stuff. It's also giving thanks. That was something we saw before. I want to recap that one more time. When you thank the Lord for what you have, it turbocharges your prayers. They shoot up to the front of the list. They, God is pleased with that. It is a sweet savor to God. He likes when we thank him. Now, I want to, I want to challenge you with this. Consider this. What would you do if you woke up tomorrow and all you had left was what you thanked God for yesterday in prayer? How much would you have left? And we wonder why we're weak spiritually. We wonder why we're ungrateful. We wonder why we have all these problems. And it's probably because we're not thankful enough and we're not following uh, the, God's order of things. Now, again, I want to stop there and make a point. If you don't know how to pray, don't let it worry you. Just talk to God. But what we're talking about is effective prayer. We're pulling points out. We're going to look at two conditions tonight. But I'm, I'm going to tell you one of my pet peeves. I'm going to ask you to consider this. Don't say that you'll pray for somebody and then don't do it. You know, the, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I'll pray for you. And then you don't do it. To me, that's about the worst thing you can do. If you say you're going to pray for someone, pray for them. If you say you're going to pray for them every day, pray for them every day. But don't tell them you're going to pray for them and don't. We have this idea that, oh, somebody else will do it. That's what we think. There's a thing called social loafing. It's a phenomenon. Uh, they found a study when they had one man pulling a rope, he would pull very hard. But when they added two, their, their effort wasn't doubled. It was actually less because they say, well, the other guy will pull a little. And the more people you add pulling a rope, the less work that each one of them does. Let me challenge you. Have you, you know what I'm talking about. Have you ever done work in a group and you kind of hang back? You're like, well, there's a lot of us. Somebody else will get it. This is a mistake, brothers and sisters. Our prayers for others, we should not make the assumption that someone else is going to do it. We should not say, well, I hope someone else will do it. We should pray. Take it upon your shoulders to pray for your loved ones and don't hide behind a group. And, you know, people are overwhelmed. They say, well, I can't fix everything. Yeah, you can't fix everything, but you can do something. You can do something. You can pray for one person. You can pray for a few people because prayer changes things. It does. You can be upset about things. You can be angry about things, and prayer will fix that. It will give you the peace that passes all understanding. I looked at a modern poll the other day, and it said that Americans are angrier now than any time in recorded history. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a quote from a famous poet. It might have been a poet, but it said, It's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. And Romans 12, 21 says, we are to overcome evil with good. Be not overcome with evil, yet overcome evil with good. And by praying, we can light a light in this dark world. Even when people don't deserve it, we can light a light. And when you're burdened and you're overwhelmed and you're worrying about things, it's not going to fix it. But prayer fixes it. You know, worrying about things is a uh, about as effective at fixing them as uh, chewing bubble gum to solve an algebra problem. It's not going to help anything. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Worry is a conversation that you have with yourself about things you can't change. But prayer is a conversation you have with God who can change anything he wants. Now, my question is to you, why are you talking to your friends for sympathy? Why are you asking for validation? Why are you not going to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm bringing it to you? And I want to give you a testimony of my life. If you could know the entire testimony, and there'll be a time for that. I've been delivered from the snares of lions and things you would not believe that have happened. And all through prayer, everything in prayer, the Lord did all of it. Miracles, confirmed miracles, witness miracles, where people said, that's impossible. How did that happen? It was through prayer because I trusted in God and I prayed to God. And as I said, when prayer becomes a habit, miracles become a lifestyle. 
So who should we pray for? We're, we're getting ready to move into those two conditions, but who should we pray for? We pray for ourselves, but who else should we pray for? I want to I want to suggest this to you again. Praying for for others and forgiving others won't just change their lives. It will change your lives. Who should we pray for? Look at Job chapter 42 verse 10. I want to show you something. Hey, Rochelle and Marilyn. Let me pause there. You know, Rochelle, the weirdest thing, I was thinking about your name the other night. This is a pause in the study for anyone watching. I'm sorry. And Rosh in Hebrew is spirit and El is God. Rochelle would be the spirit of God. And then your last name is Cross. I think that was interesting to me. And hey, Marilyn and hey, Lang. Um, Job 42.10 says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when... He prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, Job had gone through so much trouble. And it says, let, let me read it again. Who should we pray for? Job 42.10 says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. When Job prayed for his friends, and his friends had treated him a little rough. They said, you're a sinner and you deserved all this when they were wrong. But when he prayed for their forgiveness... When he prayed for them, then Job was restored. I want to give you a testimony. In the last week, I'm working 17-hour days. I'm physically exhausted. I'm hot. I'm a little shiny right now. I was out in the sun all day. I was exhausted, and I was, instead of feeling sorry for myself, I was digging a post hole, and I was very fatigued. And you know what? I started praying for another brother. I said, I bet he's more tired than me. And when I began to pray for him, and it was James West, when I began to pray for James West, I just like the spirit came upon me of energy of which I said, what is this? And the Lord had strengthened me to do the work I needed to do. When I began to pray for others, the Lord strengthened me. And that's how it was with Job. When we pray for others, that's when we also receive blessings. Who else should we pray for? Look at 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. This is Paul saying, he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men prayers intercessions and givings of thanks and supplications be made for christians that's not what it says good people that's not what it says it says be made for all men god wants us to be a royal priesthood that's what he says in the new testament he says that in peter I believe it's Peter. He says, ye are a royal priesthood. We are to intercede for people who don't even know they need to pray. We are to pray for all kinds of people. The next verse, verse 2 says, pray for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, that's a hard saying, right? But how many times we see someone that maybe you feel like you shouldn't pray for them, a crime they committed was so heinous that you say, oh, that's a wicked man. But God says, pray for all men. And in praying for them, you'll learn to exercise grace into the very deepest corners of your soul. Uh, we need more grace in this world, brothers and sisters. We need mercy and justice, but we need grace. And I'm I would give you a testimony myself. I saw a Facebook post this morning. I was disgusted with it. It was a, a present truth pastor bashing other pastors when this pastor, and this is not gossip, has skeletons in his closet. And it's only because the other parties are being graceful and not publishing the skeletons in his closet that his ministry continues to survive. And yet he's bashing others. If you don't want to be graceful with others, be sure sooner or later, the Lord's going to let that come around. He's going to let your cup fill up and flip over. He's going to reward you if you're ungraceful to others. So intercede for others and pray for them because there's going to be a time when the Lord's going to let those cups flip over. Now let's look. I'm, I'm sorry for the little mini rant, but it upsets me when I know that there are, is, is blatant hypocrisy um, and the people, you have ministries that all they do is point fingers. They're like pharisaical finger pointers. And it just saddens me because I know some of the inner workings of these. And I have personally counseled people. They have come to me wanting to destroy these ministries. And I have told them, brother, be graceful. Sister, be graceful. Just pray. Just pray. The Lord will take care of it. When, and these same men are not uh, in any way graceful. Hey, 
Sister Elizabeth. And yes, Marilyn, your sins will surely find you out. Is that Numbers 32, 23 or Numbers 23, 32? I always get it inverted. But your sins will surely find you out. That's what I counseled a young man uh, and another man about this. I said, hey, you know what? Just pray for them. The Lord will take care of it. Because nonetheless, let's move on. Let's look at the, the conditions for effective prayer. We're going to look at two of them tonight. The first one we're going to look at, and it's a doozy, is that we need to pray everything according to his will. That is the will of God. That's the first condition we want to look at. When you pray, you should pray according to the will of God. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. It says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, John, the prophet, John the Revelator, says that if we ask according to the will of God, God will heal, hear us. Many times we want to ask for things what we want when God's ways are far higher than our ways. I'm reading Marilyn's quote here. It says, Sadducees and Pharisees make up God's church. He will do separating according to our works, according to your works. You know, according to your fruit, you shall know them. And as we move on, I'm going to talk about fruit. I think you're really going to like it. Uh, Jesus in the Lord's Prayer talks about um, the will of the Father and how it's important to do and ask for the will of the Father to be done. Matthew 6, verse 10, he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says when you pray to the Father, pray, ask him for what you want, but then say, thy will be done. Now, that's a lot heavier than we think. Many times we say those things blindly, but we don't really think deeply about them, do we? Thy will be done. Imagine Jesus in Gethsemane, sweating big drops of blood, exhausted. He's been awake for 40 hours. He's been beaten and scourged. He's, he's going to the cross and, you know, and all this, this turmoil, and I've, I've got the sequence of events a little jumbled up, but Jesus says, Father, if it's possible, please spare me this bitter cup. But if it is your will, thy will be done. Can we say that in our life, brothers and sisters? Do we really mean it when we say it? Um, God's way is far higher than our way. If you're suffering, it's because he's saving someone else. Your suffering is always going to yield uh, a glorious treasure in heaven for Jesus and for us. Many people want Jesus as a savior, but they don't want Jesus or God the Father as a Lord. Jesus isn't just a savior. He's also Lord. We have to take him as a Lord and Savior. That means that when we pray, we have to ask for his will to be done. He is our Lord. He knows what's best for us. Imagine God the Father, if we consider him as a father, if you were three years old and you walked into a kitchen, your father was there and you said, hey, let me have an ice pick. I want to run around the house. Well, the father's probably going to say no. So sometimes it's a good thing to say, according to your will. That spiritually, we won't be asking to run with scissors. And many times, brothers and sisters, we ask to run with scissors. And let me tell you, I have lived long enough to thank God that many of my prayers were not answered because I was asking for the wrong thing. I was asking at the wrong time, and he had something better for me and for heaven. And because I said, thy will be done, and I mean it, every time I said, I mean it, my prayer life is far more effective, and the prayers are answered quicker and more emphatically and powerful than many Many others that I know who struggle in their prayer life. That's not boasting. I'm just telling you, when you accept the will of the Father in your Christian life and in your prayer life, things will increase. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. God calls us according to His purpose, according to His will. That's Thy will be done. When I ask God for something, I'm sure I will receive what I ask or better. Uh, if I should ask him, thy will be done. If he doesn't give you what you want, he's going to give you something even better. That's why we have to say thy will. Let me, let me hit the Lord and Savior one more time. When you say thy will be done, you're saying, I want you as my Lord. Many people want him to, to save them. They, they go about their lives. They never ask him, what shall I do? The golden question in the New Testament Lord, what will you have me to do? When Paul gets blinded on Damascus Road, what's the first thing out of his mouth? He says, Jesus, what will you have me to do? When the 3,000 are converted after Pentecost, they say, 
oh, we, we've killed the Messiah. What should we? They turn and he says, what will you have us to do? That's the golden question. And when you take a Lord in your life and you say, thy will be done. Hey, Sister Carolyn, when you say thy will be done, you're taking a Lord. Many of us want to wear our own crowns. Brothers and sisters, you don't get a crown. When you are taking Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're taking your crown off. You're saying, I'm not the king over my life anymore. You're taking the crown of self. You're taking that crown off and you're giving it to Jesus and you're saying, Lord over me, Jesus, wear my crown and direct me. Thy will be done in my life. But many of us want to live rebellious lives, lives of self, lives in which we do everything that we want to do. And then when we fall into trouble and hard times, we call upon a Savior. Now, we didn't want a Lord, but we call upon a Savior. Say, Jesus, save me. I can't pay my bills. Jesus, save me. I got cancer. Jesus, save me. But we didn't want a Lord. Judges 10, 14 says, now this is solemn. It says, go and cry unto the gods you have chosen. Let them save you in your time of tribulation. If you take Jesus as a God, you have to take him as a Lord. Now I want to pause right here for a second. Carolyn Ramos says, hi, Josh. The cussing has stopped. Thank you so much for prayers. She was struggling with cursing and praise God for that testimony. I've been praying for her and others have been praying and she has been praying and she has got the victory for the Lord giveth us a victory. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Now, let me give you one more thing about this. Thy will be done. Let me give you a testimony about David Gates. He does international ministry. David Gates flies planes around, uh, little Cessnas, not expensive planes. Uh, and he's in 96 countries. I'm working under the umbrella of GMI with an orphanage in Kenya. And please, I'm going to ask you, please keep praying for me because I'm working like 15 to 17 hours a day to try and get this orphanage planted that we can plant other orphanages. You're going to hear more about this next month. But back to David Gates and thy will be done. David flies planes and for 40 years, he didn't have really any serious wrecks. Now, a few months ago, you may have heard about this. Hey, Sister Faith, uh, a few months ago, you may have heard about this. David was landing and his plane crashed, totaled the plane, destroyed it, jet, uh, jet fuel, gasoline everywhere. It should have blown up and it didn't. Now, in all of this, he gets out with only a scratch on him. Could not believe that a man could survive that wreck with a scratch. He knew that angels had interceded. And I pray for Brother David and many people pray for him. Now, let me tell you. On top of this, um, would anyone pray to have a plane crash? Would you, play, would you pray to have a plane, plane crash? Would you say, Lord, I want my plane to crash? But when you say, thy will be done, sometimes you're going to go through situations that are brutal and something good's going to come out. Now, let me show you. David crashed a plane, and it was their biggest plane that could carry the people in the cargoes. Now, he said, Lord, I suppose we don't have the money for another plane. And I guess if somehow you don't provide and they didn't have any money, he said, I guess that part of our ministry is over with. Now, I prayed fervently with tears for Brother David, and I'm sure others did as well. And just recently, this is incredible. Someone called, I believe from New Mexico, a man had retired and he called and he said, I want to make a donation. Come get him. David gets there. Six airplanes, six airplanes. He crashed the one airplane, and this man gave Brother David six airplanes. That's incredible. And every one of them was bigger and better than the one he crashed, except for one of them was a little smaller. Six bigger airplanes. Now, let me ask you, would you ever in your life pray, Lord, I please, I would like to crash a plane, and then everyone maybe make fun of me or think that I did something wrong or you know, go through almost dying. Would you ever pray for that? No, you wouldn't. But... All things work together for the good, as God has called according to his purpose. And because Brother David prays, thy will be done, this plane crash happened so that he could get six planes and do the work in Asia, South America, Africa. These planes are going to go all over the earth. Now, that is why we have to pray, thy will be done. Because the things that God has for us might be a six or seven fold blessing, but you would never want to go through it. And I will not give you the testimony now because the Lord has instructed me to restrain it. But I will tell you, the previous seven years of my life, 10 years, I began to pray and I went through things that very few people would ever go through. And if you had asked me back then, 
you want to go through this? I would have said, this is terrible. Why would I ever go through any of these horrible things? But now on this side, where I'm at, I can honestly say, glory to God, it was the will of God. And I am grateful for everything that happened. I'm sorry for some of the things, but I'm grateful, so grateful that the Lord has broken me on that rock as he did. He knows just what we need. And that's why we have to accept God's will by praying, thy will be done. And it's not just hollow words. Let me put you to the test. Brothers and sisters, could you imagine if you were at the hospital and your children were sick? Let's see if we're real, real talk now. Let's, let's hit the thermometer and see where we're at. If, you're, if your children were in the hospital and they were violently sick, something was terribly wrong, and you began to pray, Lord, heal my child. Do you really mean thy will be done when you say, but even if you don't, Lord, thy will be done? We have to trust God so much that we want our children to be healed. And we're praying hot tears running down our cheeks and more with our heart than our tongue and our souls are being poured out before God and he is hearing it. But are we honestly saying, thy will be done? And until we can do that, we're not praying as Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed, thy will be done, no matter how bad it gets. We have to be willing to accept it. We have this unholy spirit of self-preservation. Sometimes we want to preserve ourselves, but God sometimes has something greater for us if we will just yield ourselves. Psalm 127.1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord God's a city, the watchman stays awake in vain. If God's not with it, you're wasting your time. You can build the biggest church, the biggest ministry, the biggest organization. You can tout all your numbers. Oh, we got all this new equipment. Look at all these people watching me. Look at all these baptisms. But if God is not with it, you're wasting your time, brothers and sisters. You're wasting your time. You have to let the Lord do it. And that only happens by surrendering self. And in your prayer closet, you have to surrender yourself. And you have to say, Lord, I would like these things if it's your will because your ways are higher than my ways. And if I have to suffer that other souls can live, I'm with it. If it's your will, then just strengthen me to drink the cup. Just as Jesus said, John 3.30, the greatest, the greatest prophet to ever live according to Jesus, John the Baptist, outside of Jesus, because Jesus, of course, was a prophet as well. John the Baptist said this when Jesus came along. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. We have to die daily to self. And that happens through praying, thy will be done. We have to die daily. Now, let me, let me pause. This is, I think this is a good thing. I think some of you may have heard this wrong, and I would like to correct it, I believe. We often hear, die daily. I die daily. And we think that means that we die to self, and then we become alive the next day, and then we die again. Alive to self die, alive to self, die. That's wrong. I don't believe that's right. I believe when it says, I die daily, I believe it means you die more. Now, I'm going to add a word to the verse, but you can study it out yourself. I believe Jesus is telling us to die more daily, not to have an up and down, back and forth Romans 7 experience. He says, die more. Now, consider if you were to cut a tree down or kill some kind of vegetation, and you would see it begin to wither up. It was dying, and each day it would die more and more and more until it was so dead there would be no evidence that it was ever even there. That is the total death to self that Jesus wants. And when we pray, thy will be done in our life, we're moving towards that total death to self. And that happens continually. It's not that the tree begins to wither and then it pops up and self is back. And the tree begins to wither and then it pops up and self is back. No. Brothers and sisters, pray that the Lord will let self to wither up and die completely more, dying more daily, not up and down with the Romans 7 experience. If we have that, we're going to struggle. John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John didn't say he must increase but I must decrease and increase, decrease and increase. That's not what he said. Decrease means continual. And if we say, thy will be done, you'll find yourself in your prayer closet asking for things you never thought you would have asked for. Things that are going to cause you to carry a cross just like Jesus did. Now, let me make another point here with thy will be done. Are we willing to ask to do the will of the Lord and then carry out the request when it is granted, even if it's impossible or difficult? 
You've got to be careful what you ask for. Think about Peter in the boat. I'm going to make a point about Matthew 14. Look at Matthew 14, verse 28. It says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto the water. Let's set this up. They're crossing the lake. Jesus isn't with them. And then all of a sudden, they see Jesus walking on the water. And Peter, of course, he's always brash. Peter looks at him and he says, Jesus, if that's you, let me walk on the water. The next verse in 29, it says, and he said, and Jesus said, come. Let me pause right there. I believe when you talk to Jesus in person, that's the same as praying pretty much. Peter had asked him, Lord, let me walk on the water. That is a very incredible, difficult and scary task, right? And then Jesus said, come. Now, that is a commandment. He has just been commanded by Jesus to do something that is nearly impossible. That's impossible by normal feats. Of course, all things are possible through God. He prayed for something and then received a command to do something that was incredibly hard. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto them, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? Now, brothers and sisters, when we pray for these gigantic prayers, you better be ready to walk on water. And you need to have a faith to say, Lord, thy will be done. If you ask for him to have you do something, you've got to be ready to do it. Lord, I want to do your will. There is no greater prayer than you can pray than to do the Lord's will. When that is to be a vessel of God, that means that self has to die. So if you're praying for that, you have to follow it up by dying to self and doing the will of the Lord. You feel the bridle less if you'll yield yourself to the harness. What am I talking about? Consider a harness. We're yoked with Jesus. Consider a harness that a, an oxen or a horse would wear as it would work in a vineyard, busting up that fallow ground to plant the seed. Uh, that horse, it's got reins, and consider that God would be steering us. And if we will yield to how he's steering us, that harness doesn't hurt us. That bridle doesn't hurt us. But when we fight the will of God, it becomes very difficult. And you know, the more in harmony you become with God, you will feel him turning you. You will feel the movings of providence, and you will begin to do his will. We are to do the will of God. And so the first condition we're talking about is thy will be done. You know, if you set stones, if you if you build masonry work, which uh, some somebody might know this, they put a big string. They take a string and they stretch that string out real tight. I think that was Casey Klein. Was that you, sister? Happy Sabbath, it was you. Happy Sabbath, whoever it was. They stretch that string all the way out, okay? And then they take the stones and they build the wall. And if the stones touch the string, that's going to be a perfectly straight wall. Well, if you get one that's crooked, brothers and sisters, don't move the string, move the stone. God wants us to change. Don't try to move God's standard. Move yourself to meet his standard. Sometimes we pray and we ask God to change a situation when God has put us in the situation to change us. We're saying, God, take me out of this situation. When he says, I'm putting you in this situation so you would change. The Bible is full of many accounts of people who are placed in situations that they would have rather not been in because through those fiery trials and those afflictions, God is changing us. So we're praying, God, take me out of this situation, change the situation. He's saying, I put you in this situation to change you. And there's a great liberty as well in praying and submitting yourself to the will of God, saying, thy will be done. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty in putting things in his hands. Let me tell you, I, I don't, I've not met Brother Gates in person, but I've met him in spirit many times. And he'll tell you, um, there's no worries for him as he does ministry. He doesn't know where the money is going to come from. He doesn't know how it's going to work out. But he says, Lord, I'm just doing your will. And you're going to take care of all the details. I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm going to do your will. And there's a great liberty in praying, thy will be done. But many people don't want to surrender their will because they don't want a Lord. They only want a Savior. But we have to have a Lord and Savior. That means taking our crown off. We're not kings over ourselves. And saying, Jesus, you're my king. You're my Lord. And direct me in my life. Uh, Satan... This is the final thing, and we'll move on to the next one. Satan, even when he's being destroyed, he's going to foolishly cling to the idea that he kept his great freedom. His refusal to merge his will with the will of God 
and that will of God, which is perfectly lovely and merciful and just, his refusal to yield himself to the will of God is going to leave him no room to exist any longer. But you know what? Satan's prideful. And many humans reflect the characteristics of Satan. And pray, Satan, through his pride, even when the flames are kindled to destroy him eternally, is going to con convince himself that it was worth it. He's going to say, well, yeah, but at least I didn't have somebody tell me what to do. Brothers and sisters, how foolish are we? Will we destroy ourselves because we don't want to merge our will with the holy and righteous creator of the universe? If you will listen to him and let him lord over your life and in your prayer closet saying, thy will be done, I promise you things won't go how you think they're going to be and he won't answer in ways that you think, but I promise you they'll be better than what you can understand. We need a Lord and a Savior. So we're going to move on now to the final topic of the night. I think it's the final one which is a condition of effective prayer. And it is public prayer versus secret prayer. Now we're told to pray alone and we can also, it's not wrong to pray in public. Let's say that it's good. Pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. But look at Matthew 6, 6. Jesus gives clear instructions in this verse. He says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Now, for those that don't know, closet just means like a small room of pride. It doesn't mean literally you have to go in your closet. You can pray in your bedroom, nobody's around. It says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Brothers and sisters, we're told to have that secret prayer life. Going to God alone and telling him things that no one else knows. Now, it's not wrong to pray in public. We should do that. But many people pray in public to be seen. They pray in public ceremonially and they, they pray in ways that they, they want everyone to know how good a Christian they are. Now, I'm going to challenge you. Brothers and sisters, if your prayers in public don't sound just like your prayers in secret, you're putting on a show. And you know what's even worse about that? Who are you trying to impress? If you're praying differently in front of humans, you're more worried about impressing humans than you are God. That's a solemn thought, right? So our prayer closet should be as strong as in, in public. And our prayers as well, we should know that God is far more uh, impressing him or coming to him correctly in the right spirit is far more important than impressing human. But many people want to pray to be seen, and Jesus condemned this ceremonial prayers. Now, is it wrong to pray ceremony? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to pray in church and have a special prayer on every liturgy, on every bulletin? Absolutely not. That's not wrong. But what I'm saying is, when you're doing it for a show to be seen, you're in trouble. Um, you know, it's, it's often a lack of humility that causes that. There's a thing called humility on stilts. That's like, I'm so humble, I want everybody to know it. You know what I'm talking about? Like you hear someone that say, in all humility, brothers and sisters, if you have to tell people you're humble, you're not humble to start with. It, it's, it's a paradox. It doesn't work. Um, there is different types of people in their opinions of their self and their humility. There's two types of people in the world. There's those who come into the room and say, well, here I am. And there's who come in the room and say, hey, there you are. There's people who are focused on self. And these people tend to be the ones that, you know, make a big deal of themselves and ceremonially want to pray so pretty with their big words, their big $10 words or the nail scarred hands of Calvary. And they're using all this fancy imagery, which they wouldn't use in their prayer closet because they're putting on a show. Prayer is about talking to God. And when you pray correctly, it should direct the attention of the people to God. It should not direct them to your tone or your face or your mannerism or how you cadence of you speak. It shouldn't be about you. If I pray in front of you, it should be directing you to Jesus. It, it should be that we are in harmony talking to Jesus, not that I'm pulling attention upon myself. And yet many people in this world will pray in such a way that the hearer's attention is upon them and not Jesus. And Jesus condemns that. He says, whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be exalted. And the Bible is full of this rising and falling. Those who are humble will be exalted. Those who are exalted will be abased. As I talked earlier about the ungraceful pastor that I mentioned, his cup will eventually get full. The Lord will kick it over. I promise you he will. What is this humble, this humility 
What is this um, not puffing ourselves up? Have you ever heard of humble pie? Anyone ever heard of humble pie? Do you know what, where that came from? Humble pie comes from humble pie, U-M-B-L-E, or umbles. Umbles were the innards that surrounded the umbilical cord of a deer. Only the lowest of people ate them because they were so poor. They would say, he's so poor he has to eat humble pie, like umbilical pie, like the, the guts of a deer. Eating humble pie means you're from the very lowest of the low, and yet Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Brothers and sisters, we should not puff ourselves up. We should not pray in such a way to draw attention to ourselves and away from Christ. A tree, consider this out. I, I love this. This, to me, is, is beautiful. A tree loaded with fruit will bow its branches down with the fruit. Its very posture is humble. Those who profess to be humble are actually exalted, and we can know that by a lack of fruit. Those who are puffed up, it's because they don't have any fruit on them spiritually. Those who are humble with the branches that bear the most fruit will hang the lowest, right where the people can get the fruit. By your fruits you shall know them. There is a certain pride that that apes humility. It's, it's humility on stilts. It's really just another form of pride. It's a show so that others might say, oh, look how humble he is. And Maryland says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Amen. The Bible is full of this. And if you are humble, just like a fruit tree is humble when it's full of fruit, it, its branches bow down and you can tell that it's truly a, a fruit bearing tree. But those, those trees that are puffed up and their branches are exalted, uh, even in prayer, public prayer, it's probably because they're not laden with fruit. Uh, you know, prayer is is more effective in secret a lot of times because praying a lot of times should be done with more of your heart than your tongue. And sometimes when we're around others, we can't we, we can't really say everything we want to say. And you know, who hasn't wanted to cry? And you want to hold it in because there's other people around. Let it out, brothers and sisters. Let it out. Even if you're praying in front of other people. Um, but many times we don't have that prayer that that powerful public prayer we're, we're holding back. But nonetheless, Jesus says, don't pray to be seen. Don't pray for a show. Uh, that's, 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 for us, our lives should be a sweet aroma. In the Old Testament, mm. prayer was likened unto incense um, in this sanctuary. And the closest you could get to God on a daily basis was the altar of incense. Now, that gave a sweet savor, but it was in the holy place. It wasn't visible to others. Consider that. The altar of incense, which represents prayers, was not visible to others, but they could smell the fragrant incense all throughout the camp. And so should it be in our lives, that when we pray our secret prayers, they won't be seen by others, but our lives will be a sweet savor to God and to others. And people will know, man, he must pray. He's got something about him. He's got the Spirit of the Lord in him. And it's because of our secret prayer life, that even though they don't see it, just like the altar of incense, they will smell that sweet aroma of heaven, that fragrant Spirit-led life. So secret prayer, private prayer um, is very effective. Public prayer is not wrong, but don't do it to be seen. So let's recapitulate. So tonight we talked about the benefits and privileges of prayer. We talked about praying according to the will of God and doing the will of God. And we talked about um, praying publicly in correct ways and not to be seen. We're going to continue studying about prayer. We're going to wrap for the night. Um, because I'm physically exhausted and it's probably been long enough of a, a sermon. We'll be back next week at eight and I'm going to ask you, please, please pray for me. I'm asking, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, please, I need it. I need your prayers because thank you, Sister Marilyn. Thank you, Sister Marilyn. I love the sanctuary. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God is our God. Psalm 77, 13. The sanctuary teaches beautiful lessons. Those who look at it. Hey, Sherry Buckles. So I'm asking, please pray for me because this is a very busy time and I don't have, I'm going to be working 80 and 90 hour weeks for the next at least couple months, probably two months. And I'm, I need to be strengthened um, to do the Lord's will. And I know that I can't rely on myself. I need the spirit of the Lord to do it. And I need self to die. Uh, just like that tree that withers up more and more until there's nothing left. And you can tell that it was never even there. Uh, you can't even tell. And instead, all you see is Jesus, that I don't have a legacy 
and people just remember Jesus. That's all that I want. So I ask for you to pray for me for that and consider praying for that for you. Hey, Sister Faith, um, for those who are just coming in, uh, if you want to restart the message, it's going to post in a minute. We're going to close out. I have a prayer and it's talking about, uh, excuse me, a poem. It's talking about the will of God and the will of the Lord being done. I read it last week, but I love it so much. I want to read it one more time. It says, I know not by what methods rare, but this I know, God answers prayer. I know not if the blessing sought will come in just the way I thought. I leave my prayer to him alone, whose will is wiser than my own. Brothers and sisters, let us place our will in that almighty God, the creator of all flesh, the one that strengthened Moses to part the sea and Joshua to cast down the wall and David to kill the giant and Jesus to be lifted out of the tomb. Let us put our prayers with him and according to his will and let us watch the kingdom of God be set up and the kingdom of darkness be cast down forever. So I would encourage you to submit your will to God in your prayer life. We'll be back here next week. We're probably gonna continue maybe one more session on prayer. Thank you, Sister Casey. I hope you're doing good. Maybe we can meet up when I get home. Uh, I'm out of state right now. I'm like eight hours away. When I get home, maybe we can meet up. Um, so be encouraged. And for those that are just joining, please go back, watch the whole message. We'll continue next week at eight o'clock. Um, probably one more message about prayer and then we'll move on. If anyone has any other topics they want to study, message me and we will put together some studies and some sermons about that. But let's close ourselves with a prayer together, if you don't mind. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I am so grateful, Lord, for the privilege to pray and to talk to you. Lord, I'm grateful for the weeks you have given, the, the service that you led us to have, the enlightenment of the Spirit of God. I'm grateful for the troubles in our lives which refine us. I'm grateful that you put us in situations that change us. Father, I'm just grateful to ever have known you as a Savior, but even more as a Lord, Father, because you direct my ways and you direct our ways and you direct us. And we praise you for that, Father. And I pray, I pray that a spirit of thanksgiving will come upon all of us, that we will begin to praise you more often in prayer, just to thank you that we might count our blessings and get rich quick, that we might give glory and praise to you for all the beautiful things you do for us, that we can have the eyes to have to see how much you truly do for us. Please be with us as we go into the Sabbath and Father, I'm just grateful that you were here tonight helping because I certainly was fatigued and tired and I'm grateful for all those who have prayed for me. And I just praise you, Father, for you You carried me and you helped me to give this message. You gave the message and I, I would have stumbled and fallen everywhere. So I just praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I pray for all of this in the name of Jesus, saying, Thy will be done. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters. So we will be back next week. Friday night, 8 p.m. as always. If you like it, share it with your friends. And please pray for Burn Bright Ministries. Please pray for me. Um, and I will, if you have special prayer requests, send them to me. And I have multiple people who will pray for you. Uh, prayer changes things. It changes your what ifs into what is. So with that, happy Sabbath and God bless.